great honor to be here today for this uh, panel on um, deriving value from big data and analytics. Um, I came to this topic when I started working for Microsoft um, consulting for their online services division in the middle of 2007. And Microsoft entered online services with some amazing talent in machine learning, but much of the engineering organization came from packaged software. And so I was able to watch and observe a large company with very talented people try to navigate the transformation into the amazing world of big data with all of its power, but so many pitfalls in terms of both the science and the, the business management. About four years ago, Microsoft brought in an executive, Chi Lu. Um, for those of you who don't know Chi or know his story, it's really an amazing one. Um, he came out of poverty in a small village in China to um, get his PhD in the United States, and now he's one of the top four executives of Microsoft. And he's a truly inspiring figure to work for. Um, he's a brilliant, brilliant scientist with, uh, with statistics in his DNA. And I think that's an example of the kind of leader that we're going to start to see in the executive suites of major companies, um, which really looks quite different than the background and expertise of the past. So today, our panel has representatives from three of the, the big waves of big data, if you like, from search, sort of the, really the, the pioneer and the sort of extreme example of, of big data. Um, we have Lee Fan, who's the vice president and deputy general manager of Baidu, and she spent many years at Google as well. And she also represents one of the, the, dis the disciplines of uh, big data that she has she spent several years working in systems infrastructure. We also have a sort of this, one of the second waves of, of big data. We have uh, uh, Simon Zeng from LinkedIn, where he's the director of analytics, supporting multiple functions in LinkedIn, um, the social wave, and then we, we have Michael Lee, who's a data scientist at Foursquare. He has a PhD from Princeton and is responsible for the machine learning that goes on at, uh, at Foursquare. So we have the, the three waves and all the disciplines represented here, so we'll sort of get a 360 degree view of uh, big data analytics. I'm looking forward to a great uh, panel discussion. So I'm wondering, as the first wave, Lee, would you be willing to kick things off? So um, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm very glad to see this large audience interested in, in China and in the internet. Um, as, uh, I, I view myself as an internet veteran, um, worked for Google for a long time, then Baidu as executive. Um, today's topic, definitely a popular one, both in US and China as the big data. Uh, as we all, we, uh, we all know, search engine is really the pioneer in terms of big data. Um, Baidu, as the Chinese big search engine, index hundreds of billions uh, web pages, both in Chinese and other languages. So for us, it's really big data is not a new problem. It's a problem we always solving. Um, but uh, in, in my view, um, the wave of big data is really um, just starting. I think even though people have been talking about technology for years, and I think we only scratched the uh, surface. The reason I say that is, at one side, although we saw like 90% of data right now on the internet it generated in the past three years, but I see a lot of still coming. Um, right now, majority of the company focus on the data on the internet, um, be it web pages, be it the communication, the posts, um, UGC, um, but what I see is a lot of a more valuable data uh, to human being is offline. Um, in the sector of health, education, merchandise, there's still a lot of valuable data um, offline that yet to be indexed, crawled, uh, accessible for user. And the more um, I get into this space, I feel excited because we have yet to come just in terms of data acquisition. And on the other side, I think the value of the data hadn't been really um, be seen um, outside of business world. When we talk about the value of big data, a lot of value we talked about is to really enhance the business value. 
make it a better advertisement, make a better uh, recommendation, get more user attraction. This is really helping the business. And in my view um, of years of working for Google and Baidu, both companies tr really trying to um, help user as a main focus. Of course, we also um, grow a successful business. Um, we really hope that information, um, not just information, also the application service can be easily accessible by everyone in the world. And by doing that, data is the first thing. Uh, not just like when we do data mining, we do the data analysis, not just helping the business itself, we want to help in the user. For example, can we provide a user a clear view um, what's their personal health, whether their ha um, preferred doctor is available, uh, whether the traffic on Beijing, any road you can be, um, it's easier for you to go to the airport. Like those routine things, I don't think I think we have the basic te technology, but unfortunately, all the PCs haven't get together to help them. So that's my uh, first thought. Thanks. So now let's go into the, the second wave. Uh, Simon, do you want to? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sultan. Uh, so uh, my name is Simon Zhang. I lead a uh, current uh, LinkedIn uh, business analyst team. So uh, we have about 60 you know, uh, analysts, you know, data scientists, engineers you know, in our group. We support all of the LinkedIn monetization revenue lines across three, uh, three lines of revenue. And uh, yeah, I cannot agree more with uh, what Lee uh, just shared. And uh, I personally believe, you know, um, recently a lot of buzzword about big data. Big data sounds cool, sounds hot, and uh, you know, uh, sounds fancy, right? Uh, actually, my personal belief, you know, think about the big, what the big mean? Big sometimes means slow. Big sometimes means complex. Big, big sometimes means you know, not many people can move it. So actually my job, you know, my team's job at LinkedIn is how to convert this you know, petabytes, gigabytes, terabytes you know, uh, you know, data into very small couple kilobytes data to empower a lot of internal employees to make a quick and valuable decisions and then drive value. Exactly like what uh, you know, Lisa shared. So and, uh, my team cover all the monetization revenue lines, which sounds very traditional, you know, with her you know, point of view. And uh, how to you know, make the insights you know, available for a lot of people, that's my team's mission. And uh, uh, like what you think about, you know, hey, driving value from the data, right? Driving value. I see that every day happening on LinkedIn. The reason is, you know, so let's take a very quick look about LinkedIn's uh, business model. And uh, LinkedIn's business model, actually, currently we have a 238 million unique users that uh, use LinkedIn. And uh, every month we have 148 million users based on Comscore's data. So think about this you know, hyper growth and engagement actually to create a massive amount of uh, information or data on the back end. The LinkedIn core business, actually, we derived the next wave of the product service solutions from this massive amount of data to serve our member uh, enterprise customers or uh, individual customers more. So think about this way, data is a very strategic you know, a component of a LinkedIn business. And then we derive three revenue lines, right? You know, we call it talent solutions, focus on recruiting, hiring, jobs, and the second we call it marketing solutions, uh, focus on adver advertisements you know, and the marketers. Third, we call it premium subscriptions, uh, target uh, unique uh, LinkedIn members like someone like you, right? How to make all of us, you know, be more productive and successful. So to do that, a lot of people think, oh, on LinkedIn.com, we have a lot of recommendations, right? You know, uh, for example, people you may know, Mojo, you know, uh, the news you may like, you know, people you like to hire. However, on the back end, actually, LinkedIn uses data massively to empower internal teams, including sales, marketing, engineering, product, operations, and different departments. So our goal internally is we want to have every single employee internally use data insight to help them to drive decisions every day and then take actions. So drive decision and take action, one thing is very important, speed, speed. So like you know, the water, uh, there's an, a very uh, Asian article called the, the, war, the Art of War, right, in China. He highlighted one thing, speed really matters, right? In Chinese, it's called 
being gui su bu gui jiu. What we found in LinkedIn is uh, when we make the data insight extremely fast, a lot of people would love and use it. And then we see hyper, hyper growth and uh, you know, incremental value from there. So that's why you know, so it's a very challenging topic you know, for professionals you know, like us, how to make this massive amount of data or insight into extremely fast and insightful you know, uh, value and then provide to our users. It doesn't matter to our internal employees or external members and then help them make decisions and make life better. I think that's the, my basic understanding about big data. So cool. Michael, now we've got, we're, we're on to the, the third wave. Of course, both search and social networks like Facebook and LinkedIn have a very important uh, mobile component already, but Foursquare is really uh, lives and breathes it. So can you share with us your insights about um, big data in the local mobile space? Absolutely, Susan. Um, and uh, I feel like I'm kind of a David amongst Goliaths here. Uh, Foursquare is obviously a much smaller company than Baidu or LinkedIn. Um, and just sort of show of hands, how many people here have heard of Foursquare and know what it's about? OK, good. Um, I mean, we're at a tech conference. I would hope that's <laughs> not zero. Uh, so Susan said, uh, uh, I'm a PhD uh, data scientist at Foursquare. And um, I thought I would sort of bring in some tools to sh show uh, show you a little bit about the big data we're doing. Um, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar uh, with Foursquare, uh, I like to th really think about Foursquare in terms of uh, pre-digital analogs of what, uh, what you would have done before you had Foursquare. So when you have Foursquare, you, it's a mobile app. You go to different restaurants or ven different venues and you check in, which is a way of sort of telling us about uh, th that you're there. So for instance, when I arrived today, I said, hey, I'm at the Stanford Alumni Center. I checked in. Um, but you can check into parks or restaurants uh, or even anything, something as mundane as a post office. Um, by the way, post offices are the single most reviled category on Foursquare. Users hate them. Um, it's just slight, it's in a very tight competition with DMVs. So no, <laughs> people don't like those either. Um, and the reason we know all this about these venues is because when users check in, they don't just like say that I'm here. They tell us about, oh, this is what we, do. this is what I was doing here. This is uh, whether I like it or I dislike it. Um, they leave tips about food that you can get at this restaurant, and from all that data, uh, we can sort of do the other half of Foursquare, which is recommendations. So this is a copy of the original 1929 Guy Michelin, the Michelin Guide. Um, you can think of Foursquare as like the iPhone 5S version of this. So we do like social recommendations. Um, you know, your friend, uh, maybe Susan here is an expert at French restaurants. And so if I come to the Bay Area and I'm looking for a French restaurant, I would say, hey, where has Susan been? So you can figure out what, uh, where you want to go based on what your friends are doing. Um, but we also do recommendations uh, in the same way that uh, Netflix does recommendations for movies. We do recommendations for restaurants and bars and uh, different places to go. Um, so we have 35 million users worldwide, and uh, what that looks like is this. I don't know if you can see it with the lights. Um, That's okay. Uh, but so this is, uh, uh, it looks like a map of the world, but there's actually no geographic data there. I didn't put in a map at all. All it is is a black canvas, and there's a white dot, a light, um, every time somebody's checked in. Um, this is over just like six months or something. And so you can actually see, like, right, you see the US, Europe, uh, Latin America, and see the whole world uh, light up in this way. And so this is sort of the macro picture. This is the big picture of what our data looks like. Here's the small picture. Uh, for those of you from the East Coast, you'll probably recognize this is New York. You can see the island Manhattan down the middle. Um, if I have a laser pointer, uh, island of Manhattan down the middle. Uh, you have JFK, LaGuardia, right? You can see the actual runways and the terminals. You can see the streets, the bridges. This is the ferry going between Staten Island and Manhattan, and these are people checking in along the route. Again, no map data. All it is is just a point for every check-in. Um, and this is my favorite visualization. Uh, this is a time-elapsed picture of what you just saw. So up in the upper left, that's the time. 5 a.m., Manhattan's dead. At 7 a.m., people are streaming into the city. They're checking into Grand Central and Penn Station. Um, around 11 o'clock, you know, people are very 
Uh, the city is just throbbing, right? It's uh, really busy. Um, now we're getting to four or five. People are starting to go to dinner, so we're starting to see a lot of food light up. And then now it's eight or nine. People are going to party. These, these are the bars. This is where the bars are, right? Williamsburg, Lower East Side. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., people are finally getting home. By three, the city dies, and the thing starts all over again at five. Um, so we have these amazing views of the city, and, uh, and this is just sort of you know, the tip of the iceberg for what you can do. Uh, um, I mean, I think one of the most amazing things is after Hurricane Sandy, we, uh, you could see like people would come in uh, the day before, and check-ins at Whole Foods and other grocery stores just spiked up as people were reporting and preparing for the hurricane. And then when the hurricane came, you just saw this dip in check-ins because everyone was staying home. And then within a few days, you saw the city would come back to life. And the normal cycle and rhythm of New York that you just saw and that uh, animated up there started up again. Um, and I think just sort of seeing that uh, was, for me, a very inspiring thing to see my own city sort of recover uh, from a major uh, natural disaster. Um, but you know, we have so much more that we can offer to the world and to advertisers and to uh, users. Wonderful. So I think we've really kind of covered a lot of the different aspects of big data. So let's take a few minutes now and dig into them more deeply. So um, one thing that Lee raised was bringing a lot more specific domain data online. And now um, we've just heard from Michael about how we can watch people move at a very fine grain of both location and time. I'm wondering what the panel thinks about sort of new or maybe unexpected or un un unintended applications of all of this information. Um, so we're seeing, for example, cities put a lot of their data online, and you can know about noise at different times of day. You can know how, the, how transportation is moving. Some of the sources of data are, are, data, are the mobile phones and so on, seeing how people are moving around. What, what does this unlock? Oh, um, a lot of things. Um, so one of my favorite examples of kind of data that we have at Foursquare and how we use it in a new interesting way that you might not realize that you could do. So if you think about what we have, we have foot traffic data, right? We have 35 million users walking around uh, the world telling us where they go. And the question we wanted to answer was finding an authentic ethnic restaurant. And so you might think like, okay, foot traffic data, ethnic restaurants, nothing in common, right? So, because we're really trying to say like, if you want to find a Chinese restaurant, uh, how can you tell the Panda Expresses of the world from like that hole in the wall Sichuanese place that you just love and everyone speaks Chinese and you know, the menus in Chinese are just great. Like how you can tell these things apart? Well, it turns out that if you look at uh, people who go to China a lot and you look at what restaurants they eat at, when, or what Chinese restaurants they eat at when they're in the US, that's actually a really good indicator of whether or not it's, a good, it's an authentic Chinese restaurant. Um, and so when we, when we did this calculation, we found out that uh, things like Panda Express would show up at the bottom. And then the thing that actually showed up at the top for New York was a restaurant that uh, my mother and I actually just gone to two weeks uh, earlier. And we only found out about this because a friend of hers who lives in Chinatown and only speaks Cantonese told us about it. So like, think about it. Before Foursquare, the way you found out about these like local restaurants is you would have to be a local, you know a local, and speak a foreign language. And now we can sort of just run a map reduce and figure this all out. Um, and I, I like to tell the story because uh, I think like perhaps many people in this room, um, I'm like very proud of my ethnic heritage and my ability to sort of find a great Chinese restaurant. Um, well, you don't have to be Chinese, right? Like you just need to run a map reduce. Um, and like to add insult to injury, um, the person who did this analysis uh, wasn't me. Uh, it was actually a Frenchman. So like literally, <laughs> a Frenchman found the best Chinese restaurant in New York running a MapReduce. And if that doesn't, that's not a, like a testament to the power of big data, I don't know what is. So, so I, can see, I can see how Foursquare benefits from those ideas. And of course, you guys are most likely to think first of the ideas that you can p directly put in your product. Do you have any good examples outside of what Foursquare might do? Um, we're using our data or? Yeah, using data like this. Yeah, I mean, one of the things uh, that I'm working on is collaborating with different academics, using our data for sort of social purpose kind of research. Um, we have a few people that are in the works that um, 
uh, maybe uh, I shouldn't talk about, but one of them is actually a group of economists, and they're very interested in looking at tipping behavior and virality behavior in our data. Um, there's a lot of study of virality behavior online, but they want to know, you know, can we observe if people go to a venue, um, is there some critical point above which, you know, suddenly uh, more people today begets more people tomorrow? Uh, what's the viral behavior like if we, if I'm there and my friends are there, does that make it more likely for people to come to this venue? And obviously that's interesting for us, but interesting for society in general. So let me say a word about that since this is something that I've been a huge beneficiary of as, of as well. When firms are sitting on these mountains of data, especially smaller firms that are just growing or firms that have just entered a business, it can really be overwhelming to try to figure out um, what are useful directions to pursue and what directions aren't. And a lot of the, the initial explorations of data are, can really be thought of like they're sort of basic science R&D in the sense that you don't know whether you're going to get something out of those investigations or not. It can be risky for the employees if they spend months on something and it doesn't work out, and also risky for the firm that doesn't have a lot of human capital. And so I've seen companies as big as Microsoft and, and smaller companies like Foursquare benefit greatly by collaborating with academics who generally will, if you allow them to do research and publish out of the data, will work for low wages or, or no wages, um, depending on the agreement you make with them. And uh, your lawyers sometimes want you to pay them something. But uh, you can get, you can, you can sort of put some of your exploratory analyses out to really, really smart people. And it might seem like the application is a little bit removed from your core business, but along the way they discover really great things. So for, for those of you in companies that haven't taken advantage of that, um, feel free to, to email me at Stanford and I can tell you a little bit about how companies have done that successfully. So let, let's come back to, to Lee and um, hear a little bit about your perspective. Sure. So actually, I just want to add on the things because um, um, in terms of opening up the data and opening up the platform to university and collaborate with academia, I think uh, Baidu has their fair amount of work. And we not only, um, I think two years ago, opened up the data because we obviously we index a lot, mm -hmm. lot of data, both web pages and the UTCs and also we provide a platform, thousands of machines to Chinese universities for, you, for students to experiment and to run lab reduce them. But ultimately, I just want to add on the, uh, provide my perspective. Ultimately, I don't, um, not to object to your opinion, but I don't want my friends to know about map reduce just to figure out a restaurant. I think those information should be readily available should they have the, ask the right question. And in terms of the data, I think when we talk about the big data, talk about the mobile um, application, the first thing really get popular is, to me, I know about mobile application, the first thing is uh, my kids' books and a children's story and kids' friendly games. But it's involving, as we see, not only games, just books, uh, restaurants. Um, nowadays, there's long tail, and, you know, cabs is a popular, online uh, medical consultation, um, the travel, you go to a no-no place and they will tell you what's about this place and it's all fascinating. I think one of the challenges we have, um, as the research shows, when you have hundreds of applications on your mobile phone, you really don't know what to, like, you know your question, you don't know how to search it, because um, applications sometimes has fancy names not really correlated to their function. Um, and then most of the applications are long tail. Um, if you're using WeChat or Weibo every day, that's fine, you remember where they are. But if you just call a cab in New York once, um, you just went to uh, like a no place somewhere in China, um, you, you get the application and you just one time use. And I think one thing to solve it is again, the, the data science coming um, in August, Baidu announced the Light App Initiative, basically, for those long tail application, we utilize our experience in search and the data science, we figure out what's the application on mobile side that was suitable for you to use and activate it and you have the option to install or not. And I think just one way, this is just one way data technology will help your life. I give an example just because I think in daily life, you don't just WeChat or you don't just Facebook. Um, there's a lot of long tail needs. 
you don't know what to use. And the internet actually have an abundance of resource. People developed all sorts of, sometimes I feel so weird application to fit the niche needs, but nobody knows. And it's sad for the developers, it's sad for the users, and we need a connection. And I think search engine is the connection, or we call the big data science is a connection. Basically, we need to connect the needs for the supplies of these needs. And that's, yeah. Excellent. And so Simon has, uh, it, uh, at uh, LinkedIn, sits on an amazingly rich data set. If you think about that for, for years, we various government organizations or research organizations spend lots and lots of money to collect data about a small sample of individuals and try to follow their careers over time. Um, that data often isn't, you still can't really figure out what people do or what their jobs are. Um, from that data, it's very difficult for social scientists to really understand the career path of, a, of an individual. But LinkedIn now has better data than any government data set, at least ever in the United States. There's a few Northern European countries who track their people very closely. So what are the, but what are the sort of non-obvious or sort of unexpected applications uh, for maybe benefiting greater society or benefiting new products that come out of what LinkedIn does? Uh, this is a great question. And I want to you know, reflect you know, so what Michael and uh, Lee just share. So uh, first, uh, talk about the data. Think about LinkedIn, actually LinkedIn data is uh, at a certain level quite simple, right? A profile, like a resume, and then on the back end there are a lot of connections, right? You know, people know people, right? People connect with people. Let's talk about you know, some of the basic uh, applications we built. So, and inspired by Michael's uh, flowing chart, right? People flowing you know, day, day by day. Let's zoom out. Let's consider you know, the time span you know, uh, from hours or days into months or years. Still consider people movement, right? You know, think about it. People are moving across different positions, companies, right? You know, continents or industry. And at LinkedIn, by using this profile, we can easily see the migration of talents. So in China, you know, we have very traditional word say, "Hey, water flow down." People moving move up, right? Use that as a very simple concept. Actually, uh, internally we create a talent flow, I mean high level talent flow. We found out that people really move up, right? You know, everyone, you know, every day. So, and uh, by doing that, you know, we, uh, we derive, you know, so a, a algorithm, let's say, we rank, you know, the most, uh, you know, insightful or uh, most popular companies on the world. So, by having some insights like this, you know, I, I believe in this can help a lot of professionals to develop their career quickly. So, and that's one use case. Second use case, let's talk about students, right, students. And uh, at LinkedIn, let's consider, you know, professional network, right, connections. So last year, actually, uh, last year, last summer, so a, set, a couple of interns, you know, uh, in my group, you know, one from, I think, UC, uh, I think, uh, Chicago, uh, University of Chicago, and then one from Stanford. So, and uh, by using the pure only two columns data, who connect to whom in uh, within the company, actually we, we are able to derive you know, a high level org structure for the company. You know, the accuracy at a certain level is, uh, is phenomenal. Both interns, right now they're still in the university, you know, they published in their you know, I mean, patent you know, uh, papers, and uh, by having some information like that, we believe we can help you know, organizations significantly. For example, let's say one, one company want to uh, fund a general manager to manage in EMEA. We fund those social you know, connections within the company. We can fund that person easily without even think about their department, title, or location because their social network shows you know, his influence and power, right? Second, you know, by having this type of information, we also can help other companies to develop more business opportunities, let's say with this firm, right? Uh, as I, some of you know, you know, salespeople always try to figure out the path, right? You know, how to, let's say, promote their own products or marketers or advertisers. By having this type of, you know, I mean, insightful information, we can help them accelerate successfully, you know, very fast. So, but, you know, these two are done by students, right? Interns, 
they still in the college, you know, and uh, amazingly talented people. And uh, we just uh, cannot uh, thank more for those talented people. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, partly with so much untapped potential and, and there's so much low-hanging fruit that even, you know, PhD students or undergraduates can unlock incredibly interesting new insights. Um, and personally, I love just to play with new data. So uh, it's always so much fun. So we've been talking for the last few minutes about just the data itself and the, 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 the information and insights that can be unlocked from it. Um, let's turn back now to some things that were touched on, especially by Simon, about how you actually manage successfully an organization based on big data. So let me ask the audience, how many people work in a firm or, or, uh, or have, have worked in a firm that is really a, a big data di driven company? So a, 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 small, a small set. I would say that as we, as we go forward, that's going to become more and more the norm in the economy as more and more firms, um, you know, the, the, all the firms represented here, the data sort of completely quarter their product. And so you couldn't conceive of starting the firm without embracing it. Yet, you know, we may see more and more firms who, who, to whom at first the big data is sort of tangential seeing it become more and more of front and center. So let's talk about some insights that from the, from the pioneers, the canaries in the coal mine of the big data business management, um, what, the, what the insights are. So I want to start with asking the panelists to tell us, you know, what, what, what are the really core differentiating features of a data-driven firm? What's really different than other organizations. And I think Simon raised a really great point that one aspect is that every employee has access to data and can get insight quickly. And I think that's an amazing, that's an amazing opportunity. It also is, a, is, a, is a actually asking a whole lot of your workers in the sense that maybe your sales force and, and a, you know, companies like Google and Microsoft, you know, the, the sales force has to be able to work with your databases. They have to be able to create their own reports and analyze it intelligently. That's a, a much different standard for sort of, you know, rank and file, you know, marketing organization than we had in the past. So th I think that's one, um, that's one element, but uh, maybe starting with Simon and we'll move back across, can you, can you say what are the other differentiating features of a, of a data-driven firm? Absolutely. So, and uh, uh, at LinkedIn, actually, these always start with a huge problem, you know. So, and uh, the challenge was, you know, about three and a half years ago, uh, I joined LinkedIn, and uh, I support only a, a, a one vertical business, you know, at the moment. So the first year, personally speaking, I, as a data scientist, I closed 500 different type of uh, requests, building models, visualization, you know, convincing that you know, make decision, you know, supporting PM, marketers, salespeople. So 500 different type of projects, right? I was working really around the clock at that moment. But at that moment, I support 200 people almost directly. If you could do the simple math, right, every year, every year, 500 divided by 200 only answer two major questions per, per employee every year. That's not data driven. That's not inspiring. So the problem is, you know, the system, the data set is so complex and slow. We found out that not many people were able to access those insightful information to make decisions because they have to wait hours, days, weeks, you know, to get insights. How to do that? I asked you know, my internal clients, you know, quickly, hey, what, what do you need? They said, Simon, very simple. We need to have insights very quickly. I say, how quickly? They asked, within two seconds. This is real, you know, this was real, two seconds. I say, it's two seconds, you know, that's impossible, you know, so I never seen any system, you know, can answer a question like that. They said, who cares, you know? We only need this within two seconds. Uh, longer than that, thank you very much. You, know, you don't need to talk to me anymore. <laughs> and uh, so that's a huge challenge, right? You know, before it was hours, days, weeks. And then we had to be very innovative and think of a way how to crack that problem. Actually, as of today, we developed a system, actually within three months after that question being raised. The response time, I would say, you know, within maybe a couple, mid, a couple hundred milliseconds. When people click the button, they get exactly you know, what they need. It's not what they ask. It's very different 
then compare with what's being asked and what they need, and then they can use the insight to close deals you know, right away. So after that launch, you know, we see, let's say, daily adoptions, almost 90% employees you know, for that particular department, which is huge, by the way. So think about it every week, you know, every day, you know, the insight being used, you know, and then we see the hyper leap about the uh, revenue growth, plus a better user experience you know, for LinkedIn members, like all of us, and I've been inspired. I think that's a, a key is uh, how to make the insight for a lot of people and then help them to have a better life. So, okay. yeah. Okay, so um, let me add on the, this flavorful uh, from Biosphere's. I think a data-driven company means that everything, every result, um, every project uh, um, established, and also even every critical question ask, um, there will be a follow-up question from your peer or your boss, like, what's the data to, to support it? Because um, Baidu has uh, 20,000 people, and every day there will be initiative by from the bottom up, there will be command from top up. Um, when Robin asked me a question, I will say yes or no. Um, the follow natural question, natural follow up is, what's the data to support your opinion? And that's the attitude, I think, from top to the bottom that we, every engineer, every product manager should hold to, and even the salesperson. Because when you make a request, because um, everybody in this company gets a lot of requests, like Simon said, and to make the priority right, to make the decision right, you need the data. And I think nothing is come free. Um, so we really need the data to see whether it's fruitful to get down, the, um, get down this path. Obviously, some people have more intuition than the others, so chances are you just need a little bit key data to support your, your opinion. But still, I think that's the, um, that's the key attitude you should have. That's, that, I think, is the most important factor as a data-driven company. Yeah. yeah um, uh, so, so actually, I really agree with what Simon said about um, you know, uh, making those data insights happen right away. Uh, I know that one of the most annoying things I have to do is like write a map reduce to get an answer. I write the map reduce four hours later, it returns an answer. I've already forgotten why I cared about the answer. Um, but I think uh, perhaps a more fundamental issue really is uh, the sort of using data and having a culture that's driven by looking at the data. Um, and I actually, with your indulgence, I want to make this a little interactive. Um, so uh, a friend of mine actually works at a teen. Uh, call on, uh, sorry, a teenage uh, call center. So if you're a young teen, you uh, might be experiencing some uh, psychological issues or you might be depressed, you call into the hotline and, they, uh, and they'll have a person who talks you through it. Now they say one of two things when you call. Either, hi, I'm a specialist, um, how can I help you? Or hi, I'm a counselor, how can I help you? Uh, and show of hands, I'm curious to know who in the room thinks that specialist is better versus counselor? Now, everyone has to vote, so raise your hand if you think counselor is better. Come on, raise. Okay. Now, uh, okay, and then if, raise your hand if you think specialist is better. Raise your hands. Okay, it looks like it's a, it's a slightly larger group. So uh, keep your hands up. So people who said specialist, keep your hands up. It turns out that you're actually in very good company. Uh, they had a large meeting of experts on this area, like experts in childhood development and uh, clinical development and psychology come together. They had a two-day conference and discussed this very question. And the experts all came back and said, we need to use specialists. And that was like the consensus amongst like, these uh, hotlines for years. Uh, now, okay, everyone who said counselor, can you raise your hand? Okay, so it turns out that you're not in good company, but you're actually right. Um, <laughs> Because see, see, so my friend who works for this, comp uh, for this hotline, he's actually a data scientist. And, un uh, and he just doesn't accept what people say, he tests it out. Uh, so he has, gets thousands of calls a day, he runs it through an A-B test, right, a randomized control trial, um, and he, some people get a counselor, some people get a specialist. It turns out counselor, the, uh, the rate of people who don't hang up, who like keep, on, keep a, on having a conversation with the person on the other end, went up threefold. So a huge improvement. Uh, and I, so like, what are the morals I take away from this story? One, um, you can't always rely on experts. 
Uh, we know from the literature, as I'm sure you're aware, that people are really bad at doing reasoning about statistics and like uh, environments where there's a lot of randomness. People are just like biologically not equipped to do this. That's why we be right. That's why we invented statistics, and that's why we collect data and we try to measure this stuff. But C, and I think this is the big takeaway from this whole thing, the reason why my friend was allowed to do this is because he worked at a hotline where the boss actually believed in data. And he didn't just listen to what the conventional wisdom was, what the experts said. He actually said, let's test this out. We can test it. And if the answer doesn't agree with what the experts said, we're changing it. And I think that the, that kind of data-driven culture has to come from the top. It has to come from what the executives say. And it has to, you have to hold, you know, if you're a, a leader, you have to hold people in your entire organization accountable to d data and not just, we're just going to do what, you know, what everyone else is doing or what the experts say we should be doing. Um, Excellent. So let me, let me close out this part of the discussion, and I'm sure all the, in the interest of time, I, I'll take the final word on it, but I'm sure all the panelists have their own anecdotes. So one of the things that, you know, those of us who are huge fans of data-driven cultures love to tell these stories and champion them, but we've also seen the pitfalls that can arise when you become too data-driven. And so just for, for example, if you're in a search engine, pretty much every change you make is going to go to an A-B test. That is, you might get 1% of users who are going to be exposed to the new algorithm or the new font or the new color or the new layout, and that's going to be compared to a control group. And because that, that data is so strong and so powerful and so clear and so black and white, it's really easy to pay a lot of attention to that. But then when you do something new or different or something that might have a long-term effect, it's not necessarily going to show up even in the right direction in a short-term test. But long-term tests are much more expensive. Um, for th if, you're, if you're doing an advertiser experiment, it might take, be disruptive for advertisers. It might change their prices or, or their, their click volume and so on. So you don't do those long-term experiments all the time. And you have to rely on some intuition and judgment to know when is it worthwhile to really put, put, put a change to greater scrutiny. And because you don't always do it, you can sometimes see an organization push towards those things which create short-term results, but might even be bad in the long term. Just as an example, when, when Bing launched its rebrand, the initial response of the users in the short-term test was that they hated it. They, they, they missed their 10 blue links. They didn't understand this new, more complex interface. Search engines weren't supposed to have richer content and, and more options to navigate the, the search. So, but it, it took weeks for the results to come back where the users, after a while, really liked it better. So I can see that as we go forward and firms become more and more data-driven, I think you also expect to see firms sometimes just drive off a cliff, like sort of, you know, little by little, and then one day they wake up, you know, the, face, the ads in the Facebook feed, they looked fine, the users didn't mind them, they didn't mind them, they didn't mind them, and then, you know, one day they wake up and they've, they've gone somewhere else. And that's something that's a real challenge to balance. Um, and I know everybody's nodding their heads, they all have their own stories. But rather than hear them, what I want to do is take the last part of the panel and open things up to the, for the audience for questions. Um, we have microphones around the room. Please come on up if you have a question. And uh, please identify yourself and uh, speak from the microphone. So it looks like we have a question back here. Yeah, hi, my name's Aldous Proietis. I'm with Rat Dog Industries. Um, about 15 to 20 years ago, I remember reading lots of articles. They almost all mentioned beer and huggies. And I think that was the first time big data kind of came into the popular consciousness of, of the technology people. And it was kind of a big disaster, I recall, because we did have data, but we didn't know how to ans ask the questions to get the answers. I'm not really sure that I'm convinced we've learned that yet. I'd love to hear from the panel what you guys think we have figured out in the last 10 years that will make it work this time. I think the, the classic example you gave, um, I have a confidence we saw that. Um, to that extent, but going beyond that, actually there will be more valuable things get come out from just a correlation of two products where why people buy them together um, and I think that's, to me, it's a solved problem, but uh, this, again, just the beginning, and there's a lot of problems that haven't been solved, and I believe our technology will lead to us. It's just haven't been there yet. Yeah. 
So just from an educator's perspective, you know, we've been talking a lot about how we need to change education um, from you know, elementary school up through MBAs and PH even PhDs in computer science probably don't spend, or PhDs in statistics, probably don't spend enough time thinking conceptually about data, not just what's the algorithm and how can I improve the algorithm to come up with a better fit, but actually, well, can I even answer this question to start with? Even if I had a trillion observations, is the structure of the data such that I could make a causal statement? If I changed price, what would happen? Um, and you know, if, if, I, if I changed this, this interface, what would happen? You, know, you see more police officers in areas with higher crime, but clearly increasing police officers doesn't increase crime. Yeah. And that's, in some sense, it's obvious and everybody knows it, but actually the expertise of really understanding in the gray area, when can you and when can't you learn something from the data, it's a very rare skill. It's something that takes years to master, and it's something that I believe should be part of you know, all disciplines reiterated over and over and from different directions until people can become experts in it. Yeah, yeah. no, I think it totally requires domain knowledge uh -huh. and understanding the thing you're looking at. I sure. mean, the, the, so one of the classic examples of this is uh, if you run an image search engine, um, if you just followed clicks as a metric of whether or not the result was good, you would just get pictures of uh, scantily clad women everywhere. No matter what, like it doesn't matter if you like Google for Martin Luther King, it's just scantily clad pictures. And maybe like, you know, temporarily it makes the users ha happier, but after a while they're gonna be like, actually I was here to like do some research. I can't seem to be able to do it now. So they'll go and use another search engine, right? So, so it's really, like as you say, you know, you can sometimes just follow the data and drive yourself off a cliff. Um, and you have to have that domain knowledge and understand these things. Yeah, um, but I, I think just wanna add on, see, in fact, every good, projects or products actually start from a good question. Um, like Susan just said, like, uh, can I figure out this? And uh, actually asking the right question is the most important step. And uh, I always feel like coming from the engineering background, I feel like we're confident once we know the right question is, there will be uh, enough talent to work hard to, to get the answer in two seconds. Excellent. So we have another question from the audience here. Um, I'm, a, I'm Stephanie. I'm a student at Stanford studying computer science, um, and I'm a big fan of data. I was working with Google Maps over the summer, where data played a really, really important role. Um, my question is related to your last note about the pitfalls of being too data-driven. So I'd love to hear some examples of when um, you've kind of made a potentially dangerous move by prioritizing short-term benefits over long-term, and then what measures you've um, done to kind of encounter that. Uh, so yeah, maybe I can take this. Uh, I can take this question. I think you know. So to answer your question, I have a two part of answers. Number one, actually, I call you know that's gentleman's question, right? You know, uh, ask the right question. How can we ask the right question by using data? Two parts. One is our business partner. They ask questions. Another thing is, I think it's very very important. You know, for any data, I mean, professionals. So there's three pillars. Number one, business sense. Number two, art. Number three, science, right, mathematics. These three need to combine together, actually end up with one thing, imagination, right? How can we use the existing such a blank, blank you know, data sheet you know, to derive you know, unbelievable power and energy and value? I think that's one will raise a lot of questions, right? New ideas and questions. I think that's what we are doing, right, at LinkedIn, you know, every day. So, and uh, to answer another long-term question that you asked, I think that's, you know, back to the, the vision and the business strategy. For example, at the LinkedIn, we always believe, you know, member first. That's why a lot of things we can do by using data, but we are not doing that because we consider member, uh, members' benefits the first, right? That's, you know, answer the A-B testing question, hey, if I can short-term, you know, make a lot of money, for example, selling data, we can make a lot of money, but that's extremely wrong, right? It's extremely wrong, and it would not benefit you know, the, the company or the members in you know, the long term. So I think that's you know, back to the, the bottom line. You know, what's the basic value we provide for our LinkedIn members and then help them be more successful? I think if we have that you know, I mean, vision or mission in our head, you know, always this long-term, short-term question could be rapidly answered you know, rather easily. So. <laughs> Any panelists? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about monetization at Foursquare, right? Uh, so 
as we've heard, it's not easy to monetize uh, mobile because you have this small screen and whatever you show to a user means you're not showing some other piece of information. Um, and one of the things we could show is an ad. But for example, uh, even if Taco Bell is paying us to show ads, if you uh, have never been to a fast food restaurant, if you, uh, your friends don't go to Taco Bell, if you yourself don't even quickly go to Mexican restaurants often, we're not going to show you a Taco Bell ad because that would just be a bad user experience. And we know that maybe you would click on it and you, you know, we could make a little bit of money, but we understand that, that long term that's bad for users and bad for engagement. And especially on such a small amount of real estate, we're not going to waste you know, those pixels showing you something you don't want. So I think that just sort of summarize, and it's my observation as well, that to counter that short-term uh, data-driven sort of narrow focus, you really need a clear vision. And the leaders of your company really have to tell the people what matters in the long term so that that's how they'll be thinking to balance the short-term data. So we're out of time. This has been an amazing panel. And then we'd like to thank the panelists for all of their insights. Thank you. Thank you.